this video, I will be walking you through this masterpiece of a skull painting I live streamed on Twitch. You will learn how to mix your colors, how I developed this six hour kind of a la prima painting, and my real thoughts on how I view my own work. As in my recent videos and those going forward, I have time stamped everything in the description below. I've also made a time lapse of the entire painting from start to finish so you can have a more holistic idea of the full process. You have made a graveyard. Here is how I set up my palette. I will show you a still image of the palette once everything has been mixed, and I will have labeled through the rough estimates of color ratios in each mixture along with some helpful tips. Take a screenshot of it if you like. I start by mixing five piles of color for the skull ranging from dark to light, and three piles of paint for the cloth in the background. Taking your time to mix colors and organize them on your palette will assist you in being more mentally organized during the course of your painting. I constantly modify these colors and I mix between them with my brush as I paint. I will focus on getting the right light value and then I will tint that value with some color from above. Working this way will help you to be more spontaneous in your painting and it will save you time from always having to mix every color from scratch. I often will start quick studies and paint using a mixture of ivory black and cadmium red, but I decided to switch things up and use Fusain Nitrum B Charcoal to do the basic sketch. Here I could just focus on the large light shapes and dark shapes, so I shaded in very basic shadows that I planned to shift around until I got the drawing in the ballpark. My dear morons, it is imperative that we get in the mindset of always putting the drawing first. In every video, I stress the same thing in the beginning. Squint your eyes to rule out any details so you can see only the large basic shapes. These are the shapes you want to draw. Keeping the drawing very simple and learning to break down curvy lines into straight lines will force you to see angles. A good draftsman is able to draw joints well. If you ever want to judge a statue drawing or a painting, look at the joints in the hands, wrists, feet, ankles, and even the knees and elbows. Why is this, my benevolent and innocent mongrels? It is because the artist has a trained eye in widths, heights, and especially subtlety of angles and form. How do we arrive at such a magnificent level of artistic dominance, you might ask? We freaking draw, but we draw the right way. Learn to break the complex shapes down into simple, basic shapes and focus on getting the proportions and correct angles. And when you think it's time to move on and detail, slow your ass down and circle back to further correct what you have done in this simple stage. In this magnificent specimen of a video, and also in the next one to come, you will hear me criticize myself for painting poorly. I want to clarify this. I work alone in my studio for the most part, and I no longer have any teachers to guide me because I have reached the pinnacle of artistic mastery, thereby ruling out any possibility that any human could teach me anything in art. So what do you think I do when I find myself in such a predicament, my sweet, innocent lesser beings? I am honest with myself as to what I did wrong in my work, but I do so with the mentality that I will learn from it and improve in my next work. There are several paintings I have done recently that I do not like for various reasons. I do not like fooling myself into thinking I am a better painter than I am. Even though I am the greatest and sexiest painter alive to date, I am extremely humble and honest with myself and especially you. My point is this. It is important to be able to criticize your own work without being emotional about it because you will improve. Do not fall into the trap of artistic self-destruction. 
painting is hard like my biceps and it takes a lot of time. If you're going into this line of classical art and you wish to learn, it can be very frustrating at first and it is very easy to get discouraged. You'll find that you don't like a lot of the work that you do, so it is important to voice what it is specifically you do not like so that you can work to improve these weaknesses going forward. And do not be a weakling and convince yourself that you are better than you are, but at the same time, recognize the things that you do like about your work and try to improve and replicate them. One of the keys to being a solid painter is to be a solid draftsman. Every time I practice drawing, my painting shoots forward. One of the best exercises you can do is to do simple pencil drawings off a live model. I prefer at least two to three hour sessions of a single pose. This will give you enough time to properly build the drawing up and practice correcting it. But Lewis, this is a skull painting. Why are you talking about this and not about your skull? Idiots! The development of the skull has everything to do with the drawing. The block in and the work on top of it reflects my current level of practice. Every problem I have in the skull is due to the drawing at this stage and me having to correct it. It is a constant struggle to figure out what I have done right and wrong while coming up with the correct solutions. Can you imagine if the drawing was already perfectly laid out for me? No, I am not saying that tracing it is optimal, so let me rephrase this. Can you imagine if my mind fully grasped all of the intricacies of the skull from the start? All I would need to do would be to focus on beautiful colors and technique. It would greatly push the painting forward. This is why studies are done beforehand. It is not just to produce lines to paint mindlessly within. It is to gain a solid understanding of the subject matter that will be obvious in the finished piece. As I always say, a painting is an artist's understanding of what they are looking at. I purposely made this a quick study in the interest of getting a video out for you buttholes for Halloween. So this is only two days of work, which means it was about six hours of painting. In preparation, I had organized my thought process before I started painting. I used walnut oil as my medium, but I did not use this until the very end. Adding too much oil to your paints in the beginning of a more or less a la prima painting will prevent the paint from properly covering the canvas, or in this case, the birchwood panel. I painted the darks very thinly to start while focusing on getting the light impression and the drawing. I then worked the midtones next to the darks to further correct the drawing. I then proceeded to bring the light value up with solid brushwork while I squinted. I prefer working from dark to light because I find it easier to slowly bring the light up instead of being blinded by something too white and having to muddy the paint by adding dark. You might find that you have trouble bringing a dark up by adding light over it. This is why I chose to paint the darks in thinly at first. You might have to pull some of the darks away as you paint over them with a lighter value. One of the techniques I use when I am painting light into dark is to press the light brush into the dark and pull the dark paint up as I push the light paint on. This takes practice and you might have to do several passes depending on the value difference you are working into. Painting the darks thinly is a good habit to get into because it's best to have the darks recede and have the lights more thickly painted. This creates a nice sculptural feel that I frankly did not achieve in this piece. I'll constantly add light, correct shapes, and increase color variation as I paint. I normally save the highlights and the darkest darks for the end. In this manner, I can properly accent the painting and make it pop forward where I wish it to. Now that the painting is more or less developed, I want to tell you what I did wrong and how I could do better. Frankly, I was not drawing well during this process. The colors are slightly more yellow and have less variation than I would like. I did not do a good job developing the form in the skull at all, in my opinion. 
the line variation of soft and sharps is lacking, and this can be seen especially in the eye sockets, the bottom part. The result is a flat and boring skull. This painting would benefit from two or three more days of work done after it was dried. However, I am not going to return to this, but rather consider doing another in-depth skull study later. It would benefit me to do several pencil drawings to get my mind back into painting shape. I am telling you these things not to bash myself, but to rather give you an insight into what is going on in my own mind as I look at this work. This is how I think while I paint, and also after. If I do not pick up on these things, I will continue making the same mistakes and developing bad habits. I know from experience how to get back on track, and I want to encourage any of you who might be down on yourselves to understand that even people who are genius mastermind specimens like myself who have been trained make these mistakes and have paintings that they are not too proud of. However, this is how we turn these works into strengths. We learn from them. I chose two one-inch hog hair dagger brushes to work the cloth up. I used one for the darkest darks and the other to bring the light up. I explained this in the live stream that to make the skull look better, it was important to work the cloth around the skull. It is the same as having a beautiful frame on a painting. The right frame will always make the painting look better. Sometimes you might find that you are refining a portrait for a long period of time and it just doesn't look refined. If this happens, check and make sure you have properly worked up the surrounding area so that it's not holding the work back. Your subconscious could be picking up these surrounding areas. If this happens, develop around the portrait and it will make the face look better without you ever having to touch it. I did the same with the cloth here. I didn't paint it as much as I saw it in nature, but instead I put a bit of creativity into it for a more Halloween feel. Now, this is a photograph of my setup. I was working from real life, and I'm going to break down all the intricacies, if you will, of what I was looking at, all the angles, all the measurements, and uh, keep in mind, these measurements, I don't just uh, say, oh, well, the width is this wide and it's this high, and then leave it. I'm constantly circling back, pretty much up until the very end, and correcting these, these points, all right? So that's the thing, you just have to circle back, circle back, circle back, and train your mind to constantly pick these uh, shapes out, to recognize what points to measure off of. And if you're gonna measure off of a point, make sure that point is indeed correct, because if you're measuring off an incorrect point, then everything that you measured that point off of thereafter is also indeed incorrect. So the first thing we do, what do we do? We get the height, the height, Damn it. the height, okay, and we get the width, right, and then we essentially divide, if you will, this and get the brow line, okay, he has no eyebrows, get the brow line and we get this distance and then this distance right here, and then the more information we put in, the more we have to judge off of. As artists, we are constantly judging, we are constantly correcting. This doesn't just happen in painting, it also happens in life. I developed this painting uh, through drawing, and that drawing was very impressionistic, if I may say so myself. I worked with large shading techniques, these shapes right here. I kind of just hatched them in, right? And I shaded them. And those shapes I moved around. But the points I was looking at specifically was I really noticed this top piece right here, this, 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 right? And you could say, oh, but Lewis, this is the top of the cloak right here. Yeah, but if you squint down, this unifies, okay? So if we squint down, just squint right now. And here, let me take this line out. I want you to squint down 
and if you squint, do you see this light shape right here? This is what I want you seeing. And yes, there is this little piece coming out right here, but I think in this case, it's more important to follow the anatomy. So we can go one, two, right here. One, two. And then if, if we want to, as well, we can, we can put that in, all right? But the idea is we're working with these big basic shapes in the beginning, right? In the beginning, so that we can get essentially the large impression, the large shapes correct. And, and we move those shapes around and it's easier to move larger basic shapes than a thousand small shapes. That's why we don't detail in the very beginning. All right, now this is very important. A lot of people mess this up. I, of course, uh, never do. Is getting the height of the nose, this socket right here, for example. Plumb line, all right, draw a horizontal line across. Now, <laughs> this is not a, uh, I'm not doing anything fancy in Photoshop here. My, my hand is just this steady. I can keep on going back and forth all day long. This is a straight line, straight line. And what do we notice with the straight line? Look, look, one, two, all right. So this eye socket is higher than this one. And these are the things that we have to keep in mind as uh, superior beings. Boom. Shakalaka. We see where this piece is in relationship to the bottom of the eye sockets, all right? Those are the eye sockets. And then from here, I'm looking at this shape, this shape, and also this shape right here, all at once. And in doing so, you will be more able to determine the size of these shapes. I don't know why I put crosses in them, but I did. Now, this is uh, something uh, quite interesting, if I may say so myself. Uh, I was working with uh, this area down here, and uh, one of the things I was having trouble with was making this turn like, pop out, right? It looked very flat, and I shouldn't, shouldn't say I was having trouble with it. I just simply noted it, and then I fixed it very easily. But the fix was essentially, look at this. This is really cool. Not only does this pop out because of the value, how light or dark it is. But let me zoom in here. It, it also comes towards us because of this. Look at this, the gums right here, which there's not gums, but then it kind of arcs up and then goes over this way. Do you see that? Kind of pops out at us. And the same thing here, it goes like that. And so at first I had just kind of drawn these straight across like this because it was being very basic. Uh, but as we develop, we notice these subtleties uh, that are anatomical. And one thing, in fact, uh, that really helped in seeing that was actually to go up close to the skull, because this was done, it was, a, it was an actual setup. I just went up and I observed it from different angles, right? I observed it from different angles and to try to determine uh, exactly uh, the anatomy of it because from further back you can get an impression but sometimes you can't always see all the little intricacies that you need to know that understanding that pushes your uh, drawing or painting further right you need to have that understanding all right so when we squint down here we don't see this piece it's not necessary so what what we look at is just this right here without without this right so, so we essentially just can block this in. All right, so that's what we do. Block that in, and then for this, the teeth are kind of going at an angle. They're not necessarily going straight across. Let me do my uh, horizontal line. Fuck. Hmm. It's literally going right through the center. Self-edit that out in editing. Must be some optical illusion uh, playing off perhaps my head is sideways or the camera uh, was indeed crooked a little bit when I took the picture. There is no way that my eye did not pick that shit up. Now for the rest of it I was pretty much artistic about it. I just kind of got the uh, impression of the, uh, the drape. I didn't want to waste my time trying to get the intricacies of all this stuff. They only held me back. Uh, so I just went through and kind of did a little brushy effect. I went, uh, used the dagger brush and uh, put a nice little tooth on it. Uh, yeah, 
Uh, this is very important too. Uh, to work the skull up, I worked the cloth up because it's like a nice picture frame. A nice picture frame, okay, accentuates the painting. It makes the painting look nicer. It doesn't hold it back. Now a bad frame can hold it back. So the cloth in essence <laughs> yes, was holding back, okay, was holding back the skull face, right? And so I would alternate between the skull and the, the cloth. Hopefully that was coherent. I don't remember what I said, but I think I am going to roll with that. Once again, I have proven my intellectual superiority over you lesser beings by delivering another big slap of painting knowledge to your fat face. And always remember, death cannot stop such a noble and elegant creature such as myself. So until next time, I am Buscadetti. And let this be a lesson to all you. <laughs>